in terms of the actual courses, I feel like you don't remember a ton of like the material you learned. That's not true. I do remember some of the random things we learned, but I think skills like working on group projects, learning how to work in a team and coordinate a group, to work with personalities that are different from you. So for example, I'm very type A and everything has to get done like way before the deadline. So people who procrastinate to like the night before stress me out, but you end up working with all sorts of people. That really helps me now. I work on a lot of um, medical research outside of my classwork and learning some of that coordination skills. Like how do you get everyone to talk about it? How do you get everyone to work on the same deadlines how do you learn to establish good boundaries and stuff these seem kind of like not very resume worthy skills but they're so useful especially once you're in the hospital setting and you're with you know a team of different students your team with a nurse a respiratory therapist dietitian and basically all of medicine is really a lot of collaborative work you're with a bunch of different people and so learning to work in a team is really really important and learning good communication skills and i think resolving conflict is one of the biggest things you can learn. Learning how you can do it in a respectful way and also learning from all the ways you do it wrong are probably the best way you can learn. I think learning to participate and putting yourself out of the comfort zone is actually one of the most important things you can do. I probably didn't speak most of high school until I started really getting into it by the end of high school. If you're like me and you're naturally shy and you just don't talk and you don't participate but you like know all these things and you have a lot of thoughts you learn that everyone's pretty nice and respectful that if you participate and you throw out these like ideas and opinions that people are going to respect it i think learning to state these kind of things and speak up and realizing that it's okay to even if it disagree you know you disagree with everybody else is a really helpful skill for university whether or not you choose medicine or any other career but i think in medicine that's really important learning that skill of speaking up and also just like standing up for yourself in a way is really important in general, how did you get involved or continue your extracurriculars moving into university? I got involved in a lot of the work and volunteer and things that I found my passion in definitely when I was in high school. So I do think high school is a really instrumental time into developing yourself and actually finding these things. I don't think everyone does, but I think when you look back, you realize that all the dots connect. So for example, I really got interested in a lot of um, the community service work at the very end of grade, of grade 12, I think I found um, the population that I really love working with. There's a lot of opportunities brewing, I think, from taking advantage of your high school years. Um, so for fun extracurriculars, I think finding like what the level of involvement you want to get into. So for me, I picked up in intramurals on the side. I also found a way to combine what I wanted to do. So I think I, I volunteer with a group of hockey players that are blind and they play hockey. And so I volunteer with that a couple times. Um, so finding that way to combine, say your interest in community service as well as your, your for fun thing. But I think most of the time I played hockey was really just through the intramurals too. And that's really nice. It seems like you're taking time away from studying, but just getting a couple hours out, meeting some new people and getting some exercise. And um, remember to, I think having an identity outside of medicine is really helpful. I think that's something that I struggle with personally. It's really easy for medicine to creep in and take over your whole life. I feel like it can start, um, you can start feeling bitter about the fact that you're, you're in this field that takes everything out of you. So I think taking that time to maintain something that's outside of you, maybe that's, maybe that's hockey, Maybe that's music. I always made that deal to myself that school had to come first, though. So, for example, if I had a midterm on Monday and most of our hockey was a Sunday night or Monday night, then I wouldn't go. You have to know for yourself what the what the different pieces of the pyramid are. So, for example, that's school, that's, you know, health, family, and then where does hockey rank? I think it's important to realize that you can't do every single thing at once. That's actually a thing I think a lot of university students struggle with, definitely in the first year. Extracurriculars actually overwhelm what their original purpose purpose was, trying not to actually get lost in some of that because it's really tempting. Just a bit of self-control is, is difficult to achieve, but is definitely really important for your own sanity. How were you able to find the research opportunities? How did you find those opportunities in high school? I think it's really hard to cold email physicians as a high school student. I would say it's a lot easier to find research opportunities once you hit first year. I'm not exactly sure how to go about finding one in high school. I will speak to like how most people can do it in undergrad and maybe you can try translating it over. So definitely the professors that you really like interacting with, I would go up to them, even though that seems super intimidating. Be like, yeah, I really like that, you know, I really like that research you said. Um, is there any opportunity to get involved? And that's usually as simple as it is. I think commonly cold emailing is a big one. So like looking through the Faculty of Medicine website, 
say you're interested in pediatrics, you're really interested in eating disorders and like finding this particular research who does that work and then writing them like a nice letter and make it really tailored, I think is the key. It's like writing a cover letter for your job. No one ever wants to get an email that's like, I just want to do research with you and it's kind of very, it looks like it was copy and pasted for everyone. But, you know, I'm really interested in eating disorders because of this. And um, and I think another key one is to know what you're offering. Are you offering to be a weekly volunteer? Are you offering to be a summer intern? How much time are you offering them? Be very concrete about that. Are you hoping to get paid? Are you hoping to volunteer? And so they kind of know what they're able to give you or if what you're offering matches what they need. And also in your letter, tell them what kind of level you have. So if you know you did science fair and you you already learned how to pipette and all that stuff, tell them that you did that. Or you can also just be honest with you, like I have zero experience and just having that expectation um, they know what they can offer you and what they can't is really helpful. Um, I think there's actually something that I think is also helpful is just like asking around. Our brother also does research, but he's in the engineering field and just talking to people you know and just being straightforward about the fact you're looking for research. Like, hey, um, I heard you're you're in this field. Um, do you know anyone who's like looking for a research student by chance? And usually the first person you talk to is always like a no, but somehow someone, but he's like, hey, I know someone who also knows someone and they kind of pass you around enough times until you hit someone who's just like, yeah, I actually am looking for labor. So that is a useful tip. Should we volunteer at medical centers even if the position isn't medically related, such as a salesperson? I would say no. That's my personal opinion. I would actually say if you volunteer at a medical center that's not in a medical capacity, then I wouldn't do it. I would actually, I would rather choose an opportunity that's not at a medical center. It wouldn't be medicine, but it would be like a people-centered approach. For example, maybe you're volunteering at a center that helps with education for children with autism and you're in a teacher capacity. That's not, you know, medical, but I actually think that's a bigger experience learning to um, work with a population with a particular health challenge and that is a more valuable experience than working in a medical center doing something that's maybe more business or more business or sales or something like that so I would actually choose more on thinking about like what can I learn about someone who's different from me or what kind of soft interpersonal skills can I pick up where did you do your undergrad uh, did you enjoy it is there anything that you would change now so I did my undergrad at UBC. So that was a really uh, tricky choice I felt because I was considering a bunch of different options. I was actually really strongly considering going to the States because that was that was a cool thing then. There's some more practical reasons for that. So there's a, there's some different opportunities you can do in the States as opposed to uh, UBC, which is like a public institution. But I ended up choosing UBC. Honestly, it was a money decision. And if I would go back, then I would definitely go to another city, go to another country. Most people feel that when they go to another school, they they learn a lot about themselves and be independent and learn the whole adulting thing. But yeah, I didn't end up doing that, but I'm okay with it. I think there's a lot of benefits to staying at UBC, definitely the cost. I think someone asked me, asked a question about how much it costs to attend medical school. So medical school is pretty expensive and then you're kind of in it for the long haul. So it's 20K a year per year of med school, but then we also do residency. So the average residency is five years, but the shortest end is two and some people go up to seven years and that's not counting extra training. It kind of helps that you're not living on so much extra loans. So that's kind of like a practical reason. I think in terms of opportunities, what did help end up leading me to stay at UBC was to carry on some of the volunteer opportunities and some of the research I was already doing when I was in high school. I think it's definitely easy to restart again when you go to new school, but I'd already found a lab and a physician that I really like working with at BGH, and I kind of wanted to carry through with that, which I ended up working with him for the rest of my undergrad. But I think it would have been totally easy to just start anew when I was in first year. Did I enjoy it? I would say some of undergrad was terrible. I would have told myself to actually take it easy in undergrad, but I was so focused on getting into medical school. That was like a really like all in mindset, which I think was good, but a good mindset to have is a little bit more balanced. And I realized like this is a long haul. Every single day, every single year is going to be a grind like this. It's going to be just as busy and hard, if not just busier and busier at every stage. So realizing that I would have gone back and been okay. And I think I think striving for balance is also important in high school. Take it a little bit easier in high school. That's it, like do work hard. What kind of qualifications did you need to enter the med program? So for UBC Med, you don't actually need any science prerequisites anymore, but you do typically need a four-year undergrad, um, or you can be like me, you do three. Um, so you do need at least 90 credits. And most people, I would say, get their undergrad degree, and some people, it seems very common that these people actually also get a master's and stuff. And so you need to get that many credits. I think they still have an English credit requirement, so that doesn't apply, though, to other schools. So I think most schools 
other schools in Canada and definitely in the States, they have a lot of requirements. So most of that is a full year of Gen Chem, a full year of general physics, a year, I think a year or half a year of organic chemistry, half a year of biochemistry, at least a year of general biology, but generally people take more. And then some schools might say something like statistics. I think Ottawa wanted statistics. Some schools want microbio, um, human physiology or anatomy. Say like the most common path being you want to go for a science degree of any types so like types usually biology pharmacology physiology microbiology or some like biochemistry very common very popular you can do that for two years you're going to take all those general courses so general chem general microbio and then usually after your second year you take the mcat and that usually takes a good two and a half months to three months of studying and then some people will apply to medical school that year right at the beginning of third year and then you spend the entire year applying it's a very long process you, you write these really long applications and then they invite you for interview that you spend a whole semester flying around for interviews. So you basically apply in September and then you don't know you get in until the following May. And if you get rejected, then the process rolls over to another year. So for UBC, the first round is um, they make the academic score, which is based on your MCAT and your grades. And then the other 50% is by your extracurricular. So there's different categories of working with a diversity of populations. The category was leadership, um, but they have a, a lot of extracurriculars and they really value that. I would say I hear most people definitely say quality is actually much more important than quantity. I think they really read into the write-ups. So it's basically how you talk about what you actually learned and how much initiative you did. But I would say for generally med school, we talk about like a few pillars. You should probably have some research just to try it out, even if you end up hating it and decide not to stick with it. Do some leadership, definitely do some community service, and I think healthcare experience. Part of this is also knowing for yourself to know if you want to do it, because like working with people in the healthcare context is quite different and it's it's very fulfilling to some people and some people really hate it. What are typically like plan B's for for students who uh, aren't successful getting into med school or? So for me because I was applying my third year I would apply again I think the average amount of times people apply is three times. It's definitely a lot of people who apply even more than that. It's also a numbers game sometimes. Like even the most qualified candidate, there's only 200 seats. And they say that like, honestly, if they took the first top 500, they all would have been amazing medical students, amazing doctors. I thought about doing some similar careers. I think I'm quite committed to the idea that I quite liked medicine and helping people. So I think I would have been just happy as a pharmacist or a dentist. And so I was keeping in mind, making sure that I was having all those classes for those things at the same time. I also thought about applying to paramedic school. I did consider briefly because I, I do love research and sometimes I wonder if I chose, should have chosen that instead. So I was thinking about like, should I apply to a master's and then eventually think about getting a PhD and going into like kind of medical research and stuff. But a lot of people actually end up going into the research route because they end up loving the science, loving the biology and how fascinating it is. So I also started looking into why we need to qualify to apply to medical school in the state. But that's an option and some people go abroad to like Australia. Australia or Ireland, but going abroad, it has its own challenges though. It's quite difficult to come back because you're considered an international medical graduate until there's spots here for people that are Canadian or people who graduate from American medical schools. But because some of the requirements are different and some of the stuff you learn is quite different, then you have to pass a different test. And so there's there's definitely- Do Canadian uh, hospitals consider candidates from the US differently than from other international places like Europe or- So I believe American candidates are actually considered the same as Canadians. And um, the reason for that is they go undergo very similar curriculum review. So every medical school has to be reviewed by I think like an international body. I think it's quite easy to come back from the States. Uh, I think it's actually more more common to go down to the States to do some training just because they have so many amazing centers and they're just a bigger country. But it is different going to Europe, I think depending on which country and stuff, because they do a different requirement. So in Europe, most schools, they go in from high school. And so the way they do their system is very different. So for the medical system deciding who's going to come back, they're trying to compare apples to oranges. They're like, how do we judge who's a good student? If it's a totally different system, I would say if you can go to school in North America, just it cuts down on a lot of uh, complications for sure. Which area of medicine is your program? Is there a general program of some kind? What does your program prepare you for? So for most medical schools, the first four years is you study everything. 
I think I went in thinking to medicine that if I only want to do one specialty, I only need to know that particular field. All of the body is so interconnected. So we kind of have to know a little bit about everything. You spend the first two years in lecture, just learning about everything and cramming as much knowledge as you can. And then we go into the hospital and we just rotate through everything. And you kind of get a sense, you know, maybe you want to do surgery. Then you spend the fourth year going around the country and then getting a feel for which program you want to ultimately spend the next five years training at. And then you get to play around and kind of try on some different hats in fourth year. So we call those like electives, which is just trying on whatever you like, basically. And mm -hmm. are you going to specialize in something? So right now I do, but there's a couple of different fields that I like. I came in thinking I wanted to particularly do um, ophthalmology, which is like eye surgery. But lately I've gotten really interested in internal medicine. I realized the beauty of a field that takes basically everything in account. And so that's something I've like. I do really like pediatrics as well. It's always been something I've been interested in. Actually, family medicine is one I've creeped, has creeped up on me. In UBC, we rotate and we actually work in family practice every week. And um, you realize that actually how meaningful that is. And it's cool because A, you get to know everything and you spend a lot of time working with patients and it's very meaningful because they know the doctor for like the last 20 years and they know each other almost like they're friends and they're all family. That is such something I really liked. I didn't realize that a lot of family doctors actually also do a little bit of extra training. So for example, this term I did one where she specialized in helping people give birth. There's obs guys who do the complicated surgeries, so the C-sections and stuff, but there's actually a lot of family doctors who deliver babies. And that's something I didn't know, for example. And there's actually some family doctors that help call, um, it's called first assist, so they help in the surgery ward. Um, that's something a family doctor can do. Say they don't do the most complicated surgery, but they can help assist with like some of the things. And so, um, so for me, I would say the most rewarding part of medicine is when I'm in family practice and I feel like I'm helping people fill in this knowledge gap. What's also really fulfilling about medicine is just that feeling that maybe you've done something to help people. I like the idea that someone's bringing in their problems and then you're giving them a solution. So you're, you're kind of fixing their problems or at least helping them fix the problem for themselves you know there's like surgery which i think is like cool and stuff i guess you guys my bias is i like eye surgery and like the idea that someone's struggling with their vision they're going blind and they're stressed about this and then suddenly you go in with this surgery within two weeks they're able to see and that's just like amazing and just imagine the quality of life difference that you're able to make i think the ability to re restore people living their best life is one of the most amazing things about medicine or giving them more years to spend with the people they love most that's just really crazy that we have that capacity to do that it's a it's definitely a privilege i would say i think the most stressful part of medicine though is when you do everything you can and you can't help them so i think the best part about medicine is feeling like you can help and the worst part is feeling helpless and like you can't make a difference i would say like that's hard for me as a medical student and sometimes feeling incapable and overwhelmed by the amount of knowledge i had to learn and there is a reason why it's so many years because there's a lot of learning and also because it's so individualized, it's it's kind of beautiful in that way and frustrating in that way. So the most beautiful part, I think, of medicine is you're doing a lot of problem solving and that can be meaningful. They can really save their life. But then I think that's also really difficult because sometimes it's very ambiguous. Every case that walks in is still different. Every day is a different learning experience. You don't ever really get bored. I had a lot of fun in high school. I think that's really important. If you choose medicine, like there is just so little time to ever do that again. And like these kind of experiences you really accumulate and you are able to look back and be like, wow, that was, that was really cool and really fun and there's not a lot of time to do that once you get into the pre-med grind and into med and beyond and then you have adult responsibilities so